there are certain things you can say in the context of an academic study about how we can respond aesthetically to slavery. And there are certain things that you can't say. Um, and my work as a painter um, and a draftsman, I suppose, attempts to go into areas where I feel I can explore things and say things which I can't say in the academic books. And yet, throughout the ideas that I come across um, in the academic work, um, inflect and kind of saturate the, the drawings and the paintings that I make that deal with this use of race and colonialism. Um, if we're going to try and think about specific examples um, where I can take in my practice as an artist um, and in my practice as a draftsman various specific images or visual inheritances from uh, the, you know, the, the visual history, the previous visual history of slavery, and develop them in ways which they, um, you know, simply couldn't be developed in my academic writing. I suppose there are two, there are two absolutely crucial images within the, the, the whole image bank of, of um, Atlantic slavery, which have sort of dominated so much of the discussion by, by art historians and by me in my books. One is this runaway slave, um, who was stamped on, on every single or a high proportion of runaway slave advertisements and existed in a kind of visual stasis there where he's sort of cut off at the knees, he can't really go anywhere. And my whole idea in making this in various sizes and various scales and in stamping him on all sorts of, in all sorts of contexts, in all sorts of surroundings and all sorts of different images was to kind of break him out of that visual imprisonment that he had to endure, um, not only in the actual slave advertisements themselves, but in terms of the way we were able to discuss him as academics and historians in, um, in our academic books. Similarly, the, the other, uh, or maybe equivalently, the other really famous image, um, which you still see kind of ubiquitously reproduced in books about slavery, is the image of the slave ship Brooks, you know, the, the famous design of the, the diagram of the boat seen from above with all the bodies lying passively, completely reduced to abstract patterns, if you Actually, like. The painting of Tar was described by the great surreal poet Garcia Lorca as of the essence of the duende. When he was looking at Goya's paintings, he talked of how Goya painted with wonderful bitumen blacks, which was another reason that I got quite seduced by the idea of painting with tar. So this is the outline of my slave ship Brooks. This is like being viewed from above. And this is the outline of the slave deck. This original slave ship Brooks is an incredibly diagrammatic image that was in fact a copper engraving. And I suppose what I'm doing here, yeah, is a is a kind of like a somewhere between a painterly and um, a draftsman's reinterpretation of the image. So I think it's up to you um, whether you draw that line between calling it a painting or a drawing. I mean, when does a gestural painting become a drawing? Hard to know, I'd say. Um, it's mark, gestural mark making of a sort, which I think, you know, it shares a common ground between drawing and painting. And now I'm going to populate the slave ship with some more of our runaway slaves and bring the world of the plantation and of the Atlantic slave trade into a strange conjunction for the first time. What's immediately springing to my mind here is that the slaves in the original slave ship Brooks are painted all lying supine without the capacity for movement, as if they're sardines in a tin, to use a famous image from an anti-slavery poem. And maybe what we're doing here, by giving them all different, and they're also all intensely black, so what we're doing here, by giving each slave a different intensity in terms of tar, and I suppose a different shade of black, and by putting them in motion, is maybe bringing them to life and suggesting that they had a life in the plantation after the Middle Passage, which didn't involve the absolute and simple eradication of their culture. So there we have it, runaway slave ship Brooks.
If I could give you a single example, perhaps, of how that works, I'd suggest the Tar Baby story and the fact that I work with Tar. The Tar Baby story is one of the first Brer Rabbit stories, and the Brer Rabbit stories are the most popular kind of extant form of what were the slaves' plantation myths and narratives that they told each other uh, when they were enslaved right across the African diaspora. All those stories are evolved from African myths um, and frequently from what to call the Anansi or the spider stories. In all the Br'er Rabbit stories, he triumphs over Br'er Fox, Br'er Bear and Br'er Wolf, who are the big fierce carnivores, the big um, kind of representatives of what you might see as the slave power. And so Br'er Rabbit is in fact this kind of trickster slave figure who's always doing well. Now there's only one story, and that's the Tar Baby, the wonderful Tar Baby story, in which Br'er Rabbit in fact um, is caught. Uh, the story goes that Br'er Fox makes what's called a contraption out of tar and turpentine. He sets it up in the middle of the road and he leaves it there. No one knows exactly what it looks like, um, the tar baby, but Br'er Rabbit, he kind of wanders along and sees it. It's a female figure and it's black. And it's sitting in the middle of the road and it's speechless, it says nothing. It's like this kind of black, sticky void in the middle of the road. So he says good morning to it and it won't say anything to it. So he said, if you don't reply to me, I'm going to bust you wide open. In other words, in, in Joel Chandler uh, Harris's original. So, of course, the Tarbo, he still doesn't say anything. So he smacks it one, and his like fist gets stuck in it. And then he says, if you don't say anything to me, I'm going to completely kill you. And uh, it still doesn't say anything. So he hits it with the other fist, and that gets stuck. Then he carries on trying to get it to respond to him. It won't. So he finally kicks it with both his back legs. They get stuck. And then he finally says, you know, I'm going to headbutt you if you don't, <laughs> don't talk to me. And he does that. Headbutts it. His head gets stuck in it. And at that point, Br'er Fox appears and says, you know, basically you're done for. We've got you. What interests me about that story is that um, we don't really know what to make of the tar baby. Who is she? What is she? Why does Br'er Rabbit get so furious that this black female won't talk to him? Of course, the Tar Baby, uh, it got very well known in, um, in American popular culture because the Br'er Rabbit stories were so popular. And this is how, this is a 19 kind of 50s Tar Baby made in Baltimore, uh, an interesting state, you know, Baltimore, Maryland, bordering on the southern and the northern states, the slave states and the free states. And that was how the Tar Baby was seen in